This is the most infamous placement in the birth chart, the most notorious and widely known aspect in astrology. Yes, I am talking about the sun in astrology. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you're doing really well. I am absolutely elated to be coming on and talking to you about uh, one of the most incredible topics in astrology, and that is the sun. I will be diving into every single sun sign, the sun itself in astrology, with convenient video chapters below for you to check out and uh, gain more insight and knowledge into your birth chart and also into the signs of others and the general uh, deeper idea of the sun. Does it really mean what we think it does? Is it appropriate to judge so much or think so much about the sun sign? I want to spend time in this video deconstructing that a little bit and uh, kind of revisiting the idea of the sun sign being uh, perhaps the first thing that people think of and is that the right idea? And um, I'm excited to give you guys some new ideas on this uh, very traditional aspect of the birth chart, as that is what my series through the signs purpose is. I like to give some new spins on these ancient and traditional placements. So before we get into this, everyone, I'm so pleased to announce that this video is sponsored by Aura. In 2020, 49 million Americans were victims of identity theft, and it ended up costing them a combined $56 billion. This isn't happening just to people who fall for phishing scams or use bad passwords. In fact, 37 billion records got hacked in 2020 alone from major social media sites, national grocery store chains, cryptocurrency exchanges, pharmacies, and phone and internet providers. That's why I'm excited to be partnering with Aura today. Aura's app uses AI and machine learning to protect your identity online. You tell Aura what email address, account numbers, and phone numbers you want monitored, and their algorithms scour the dark web, data brokers, and public records, quickly providing you alerts of any criminal activity. Aura's app also features a VPN that encrypts your browsing history and allows you to stay anonymous online. And I will tell you guys, uh, I really liked the idea of promoting this service. Of course, I tried it myself. And you guys know I've been talking a lot about uh, privacy and protecting your privacy online. It's something that is really important to me because I do think that there is a lot of um, sort of unknown danger out there uh, regarding data privacy. So um, yes, to uh, try it out, you can use my link, aura.com slash sky to receive a 14 day free trial and beyond that, that the service is very reasonable. So um, thank you so much to Ara for sponsoring this video. Okay, everyone, so let's get into this. The sun in astrology. What an exciting topic to be talking about. Um, you know, everyone loves the sun, right? Like, uh, what's your sun sign? Uh, people think that it means a lot, and it certainly does mean a lot. But um, I kind of feel that the sun uh, kind of gets over considered in astrology and that's one of the ways that astrology might have become uh, taken less seriously in recent times is that people uh, think about the sun sign and it's not accurate for everyone you know like if you have a sun in pisces but you've got like an aries rising and like a leo moon well you might not act like such a pisces so um a lot of people know about sun signs you know people who aren't even necessarily that adept in astrology might know quite a bit about their sun sign or the sun sign of other people and and a lot of people, um, without knowing it, have a, quite a general knowledge of uh, sun signs and astrology, what they mean. And, and people have experiences with different signs, and they kind of let that uh, color their ideas about those signs. So um, primarily, there's a lot of collective consciousness around the sun and the sun in astrology. And I would definitely point you to my other uh, entries in this series, the moon in astrology, the ascendant in astrology. I have all of the planets almost now, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn in astrology. All of these placements help to bring more context to a birth chart. It's really important that you consider um, a birth chart uh, in its totality before you uh, go prescribing too many characteristics to any one person. Again, um, to uh, over-identify someone with the sign of Pisces when they only have a Pisces sun and nothing else in Pisces might not be very contextual. It might not really paint a full picture. 
Um, so it's good to know what other placements people have. But um, what does the sun actually mean from a deeper astrology context, you know, beyond some of the more shallow uh, constructs? Well, the sun is our energy source, right? In the solar system, none of the rest of the solar system exists without the sun. Uh, it all orbits because of the sun. All of the other planets are uh, moving in the way that they move because of the sun. So we can kind of start to see why the sun has become, you know, the center point of astrology. And it makes sense that it did because it is the center point of our solar system. It is the nucleus of our overall uh, solar system. So um, yeah, it really illustrates in a birth chart the nucleus of the person. So that central core engine energy that a person has will be very highlighted by the sign the sun is in. And it just kind of depends if the rest of the chart is uh, made up in a way that really expresses the solar energy, or if the solar energy is uh, configured in a way that leads it to be less publicly expressed or less expressed to other people. Um, this really defines whether or not someone will express the characteristics or the traits or the energies associated with their sun sign. So um, yes, what I will also say about the sun is it is the best placement in your birth chart to work with if you're trying to understand what to do with your energy or where you have natural capability. To me, the sun denotes natural momentum. It denotes uh, where we can easily uh, find a source of energy, where we can naturally be uh, more benefically placed. So look to the sign that your son is in to understand uh, what industries, what types of people, what places, what locations uh, to gain energy from. Also, the sun is really good to look at considering astrocartography as well. If you follow your sun line, if you travel and you follow that line, that's a really great way to re-energize yourself, or that's a great maybe pilgrimage to make to follow the sun line and to uh, find a place or an experience that will recharge you. So uh, during this time of 2022, when I'm filming this video, though you could be watching it at any time in the future, hello from, hello from the past if you're watching this in the future anyway. Here in 2022, it might be really great for us all to kind of follow our sun line a little bit more because it's been a very uh, nocturnal energy that we've been working with and it's been um, kind of like disenergizing or uh, diseased the energy ever since uh, late 2019 and early 2020 um, led to a darker kind of heavier, more Saturnian line, which brings about it a lot of like foundations uh, material concerns and growth. But I think that honestly, this video is really timely as I am filming it on a, the solstice of uh, 2022 and it's going live on the solstice. Um, you know, I think that this would be an awesome time for a lot of people to work more with solar energy to offset the darker uh, solar minimums that we had been having also for the past few years that th the sun is becoming more active now. And I uh, predict that it will continue to become more active over the oncoming years, but it could be uh, minimal uh, due to the triple Capricorn conjunction we had in 2020, and then also this uh, lingering Pluto and Capricorn. It won't be until Pluto probably moves into Aquarius that we start to have more active solar activity. I'm talking solar flares. I'm talking uh, the way that solar energy uh, works with the Earth, okay? So because we had solar minimums, and especially during 2020, which is very interesting to think about, um, that means that a lot of us are basically suffering from a deficiency of vitamin D and a deficiency of solar energy in general. So where astrology comes in and can really help us with this as a sort of ancient practice is um, follow your sun line. Okay, where does your sun point? What planets are around your sun? What configurations do you have with your sun? Uh, these are great ways to connect more to your own nucleus energy and find your own independent source of energy or your own independent um, engine for life force energy. The sun is raw life force energy. And for this reason, okay, um, I will introduce to you that there is dare I say, a darkness to the sun. It's, it's totally an irony, or that's totally a, more of a, a, a poetic idea. But because the sun is pure, raw life force energy, 
the sign in which it's placed in your birth chart, as well as the configurations and planets around it, can also be this way. So what that means, you know, you can't look directly at the sun, right? You'll go blind. Like you have to kind of also be careful when you're working with solar energy because it is inherently destructive, okay? There's actually a similarity between the sun and Pluto archetypally. Uh, these two energies both have a uh, commonality in the sense that they are opposites, but sort of linger in the same energetic territory because of their polarity. Um, so the Pl Pluto is like uh, the opposite though. It's like frozen, freezing, icy, destructive energy, whereas the sun is like fiery, uh, hot, burning energy, but they do the same thing. You know, sometimes heat, like if you get a burn, it sometimes feels cold. And then also sometimes like a frostbite feels hot, right? So um, the sun, in the birth chart, and you know, if you have like Sun Pluto contacts, well, um, you have to kind of be careful with how you use your energy, or you have to make sure that you're not looking directly into the sun or uh, working with things that are too dangerous. Okay, so if you have a sun uh, that is configured with Mars, configured with Pluto, um, even Saturn to some degree, um, these individuals have to be particularly cautious in how they work with energy and in the risks that they take on because there's a tendency to be so full of life force energy, especially if you have a sun conjunct Mars, a sun conjunct Pluto, um, to a lesser degree, a sun conjunct Saturn, because this can actually demonstrate the opposite, like Saturn, Neptune, uh, sun conjunctions can be like a lack of energy or, or a distance or a fatigue, but especially Pluto and Mars sun conjunctions you need to be very cautious with the raw energy that you're working with and uh, make sure that you're not essentially like harnessing any types of energy that are uncontrollable or that could like uh, burn or cause some type of a negative outcome. And then of course the sign that the sun is placed in will kind of um, demonstrate how you can uh, work with solar energy, whether or not there's a tendency for the solar energy to be like uh, coming through too strongly or uh, not strongly enough. That's especially demonstrated by the configurations, the planets that interact with the sun, but to a degree also the sign. Um, also personality, right? Uh, vitality, career choices, outward expression, the way that we energize. And it's interesting to think about the way that humans energize. Usually that is a social construct. When a human energizes, because the species is such a social um, bee-like species in a way, the way that energy usually expresses for humans deals with some type of relationship or it deals with some type of connection to others or groups. So the sun will really demonstrate how you fit into groups. It will demonstrate what types of groups you fit into. It will demonstrate um, themes of acceptance in groups or themes of abandonment, themes of isolation, or the opposite, uh, themes of uh, acceptance, right? Um, the sun is the best part of the chart to work with if you're curious about who is a good relationship for you. Um, honestly, the sign that your sun is in says the most about that. And of course, Venus and Mars really uh, talk about this too. But I almost want to say as an astrologer, after I've worked with so many people, that I look almost as frequently to the sun because whereas Venus and Mars indicate where there's like a natural kind of like romance or even friendship or kinship, the sun to me indicates more of where satisfaction is or where mutual energy exchange can be found. So oftentimes I will tell you the sign that your sun is placed in may end up being the best uh, romantic partnership for you or the best friendship, okay? From the perspective of... Um, like getting mutually beneficial relationships or getting energized relationships. Maybe not so much from a perspective of compatibility or animal magnetism, but certainly from the perspective of uh, mutual energy exchange. So if you want to make a friend, look also at the house that your son is placed in. If you have a son in the sixth house, Virgos are going to make you feel great, okay? They're going to make you feel like you're... Um, detail-oriented mind is being honored and that it's not like pesky, it's not OCD, it's not uh, crazy, but it's like needed and it's helpful and it's, um, you know, observant and it's uh, needed. And um, also if you have like a sun in the 11th house, like uh, Aquarians are going to really 
um, make you feel like your detachment is healthy and like your um, network growth is uh, going off the charts and, and that it's uh, good to keep growing your network and good to keep um, amping up your professional contacts. You know, whereas, for example, if you're a son in the 11th house and you try to make a friends or have a romantic relationship with a cancer, they might not understand why you're so professionally focused. They might not understand why you need so many different contacts. They might want you to, you know, limit your contact. They might want you to um, forge more trusting relationships and therefore less numerous relationships. And this could conflict, right? So the sun really is the best way in astrology to understand the types of people to be around, the relationships to forge, and um, certainly to not let it be the basis of your decision making there. But um, it can also help to find compromises. And this is what I would really like to communicate with the sun is like, so say, for example, you are in a conflicted place, like sun in the 11th house uh, being married to a cancer. Um, there's a compromise point there, you know, you can really start to see for each other that the cancer needs more like um, limited trusting relationships, um, or when I say limited, I mean less uh, numerous ones and, and less to, you know, keep up with in the mind. Whereas you can also know that the sun in the 11th house or Aquarius person needs to just have a greater connection to larger groups and more people and, and um, you know, be out there more and be um, in public more. And there's some kind of compromise there, you know, uh, understanding the nature of each person. And I think that that's what the sun can really do. Because um, there is, despite there being an ability to compromise, you can't like compromise that much with the sun, right? It is what it is. It does what it does. And it is the root of our solar system. So I will say if you go against your sun, okay, if you try to force something that is incongruent with the sun sign, it won't work. It will just burn out. Like, so for example, if you try to like work in a job that isn't right for you just to like make money, or if you try to work in a job or a career that isn't, um, you know, appropriate for this placement, burnout will happen. So that's the best way to know if your solar energy is not being respected, or if you're trying to live basically as a different person, burnout. Okay, that's what the sun does when it dies. Okay, and uh, we don't have to face that for like billions of years. But um, yeah, it basically like uh, explodes and destroys everything. So that is within humans as well. And this, this is getting like heavy, right? This is getting hard. But this is one of the best things that astrology can teach us and why astrology is so important during a time like this where a lot of people are facing burnout, where a lot of people are facing uh, frustration, um, unknown ways forward when the sun is forced or uh, cannot find a reason to be in the current place or is in a place that isn't right for it it's just like it's going to be demonstrated by burnout um, and it's going to be demonstrated also by you know the inability to be awake okay so fatigue um, hypersomnia things that keep you kind of like turned off okay if you're struggling with like autoimmune diseases, okay, because that's also like the sun, anything auto, autoimmune um, deals with the sun as well in astrology. So if you have an autoimmune disease, it means that your solar energy just isn't expressing well. Um, also, if you have any type of uh, tendency towards temper, explosions like anger, bouts of anger, um, burnout, or um, even like hot flashes, or, you know, sometimes when you overwork, you start to feel very hot, right? You start to feel like you're burning. Um, that means that the solar energy is not escaping the body, okay? It means that the sun sign is not being expressed or not being channeled. So that's going to cue up a future, like, blast of solar energy, okay? Or it's going to be absorbed by the body, which creates illness and disease. So basically all illness... And uh, most disease can be traced back to the sun sign and the solar energy. And in conjunction with any types of like a traditional medical practices or in conjunction with, um, you know, other actions in life or, or remedies that are, um, you know, proven to work, it's a nice food for thought and a great area for spiritual healing to understand like, okay, I have like a sun in Sagittarius but I'm like living life as a, 
Virgo by being an accountant and therefore the need for adventure or the need for the outdoors or the need for high new level philosophy and concepting is not getting channeled and therefore I might feel very burned out as an accountant. It doesn't mean you have to quit being an accountant. It doesn't mean you have to quit what you're doing, but there needs to be some type of new channeling of energy that shows you expressing the Sagittarian or ninth house energy. So it's really easy when you know what your sun sign is and what house it's in to basically um, find better ways to to better express yourself because at the root of it, the sun is the true identity, okay? Beneath the uh, clothing, beneath the makeup, beneath the um, identifiers of identitarian society, uh, the sun is who we really are, okay? And then again, depending on how it's placed in the chart, that may or may not be translating to the exterior, okay? So say for example, you're a, a Gemini sun and that, uh, you know, um, Gemini sun is placed in the fourth house. And then, I don't know, you've got like a bunch of um, Scorpio placements like up in the uh, ninth house, okay, um, that really distract from that fourth house Gemini sun. That is going to make people see you as more of a Scorpio than a Gemini, and that could become very frustrating. So it's important to start, you know, having the Gemini sun to express itself more. And to some degree, the sun really should be like the center of your pursuit or the archetype or the sign or configurations around the sun should really be a central core of your life. And the other things should kind of build around it or orbit around it, uh, because that is the way that the solar system functions. So certainly, yes, there is merit to the sun being um, really the functional basis of astrology because that is the way that the solar system works and I certainly uh, don't don't uh, detract from that at all. I think that it's probably the um, most natural way for astrology to function as well, you know, thinking about sun signs, thinking about uh, the sun. But I will say um, because people can't really look directly at the sun, okay, though at the same time the sun lights everything, so without the sun there is no type of vision or any type of light. Um, it becomes kind of a tricky subject at the same time because um, it can't be seen directly, but it at the same time illuminates all. So it's the same with the sun sign in astrology, where um, it's hard to see directly uh, after you've looked at the sun sign and house placement and everything, like what exactly does that mean for my life? You can't really see it directly, but it is going to inform everything and it's going to highlight everything in your life. Okay, so a um, good way to think about that is the sun sign is basically kind of like a microscope that people look through, or it's a certain tone that people see the world with. So this is really, really great info here. You can know basically by someone's sun sign, like how they view the world and the way that the world is lit around them. So someone with a sun in Scorpio might tend to see the world in more of a polarized and um, transformative way, seeing the darkness, seeing uh, being revealed the uh, more hidden ways that society operates. Whereas a sun in Aries person may not see any of that stuff and they may be more so shown the, um, you know, newer aspects of society or the way that things could be or the very linear and very obvious uh, ways forward onto a certain path. So um, that's probably the most important thing to know about the sun is it shows people certain things or it illuminates a certain path uh, depending um, on what sign it's placed in. So um, your sun sign basically does show your perspective and it shows the way that you are thinking about things too because Mercury always follows the sun, right? The planet that deals with thoughts, opinions, um, conclusions, logistics, and um, communication is always right around the sun, either one sign behind or one sign ahead sometimes. Um, and then Venus is as well, right? Which is like romance and um, attraction and desires, wants, uh, natural aesthetics, things like that. So all of our, um, you know, wants for love, all of our 
opinions, thoughts, and ideas are all very tied to the sun sign because those two planets always are, um, you know, close by the sun. So it's kind of a bit of a hierarchy, right? You have like a sun, I would say, at the top of the hierarchy, sort of informing the entire uh, birth chart and the entire sort of perspective of an individual. And then you have Mercury and Venus uh, trailing right behind that and informing the mental uh, thoughts and then also the wants, uh, desires, and receptions. And then you have um, the rest of the planets as well, all symbolizing other aspects too. So concluding on my general overview of the sun, uh, basically it informs the entire perspective of an individual. It is the core identity of someone uh, beneath all of the uh, exterior symbols and exterior identifiers. It also is where to get energy or um, what will satisfy some of the um, needs of the soul or needs of the person, okay? Um, it's gonna be those areas, those industries, those uh, places, those experiences that the person is drawn to or that the person uh, gets energy or fulfillment from. I would say that the sun represents fulfillment and it represents life force, okay? Um, so without further ado, everyone, let's get into the sign by sign. I'm so excited to be uh, doing this. Okay, let's do this. So um, sun in Aries. So congratulations. If you have the sun in Aries, that means you have one of the most lucky benevolent sun signs. The sun is indeed traditionally considered at home in Aries, meaning that it expresses itself very well naturally in this sign. If you've known a sun in Aries person, you've probably been uh, witnessing their uh, love for life, their uh, gregariousness, their adventurousness, their uh, want to move forward, to um, sprint quickly, to climb mountains, to uh, climb Mount Everest, to uh, be pretty crazy. And um, they get quite a bit of uh, actually jealousy for this, and that is one of the negatives of Aries, but perhaps one of the only negatives of the Aries sun sign is uh, people can be very jealous of them. Um, indeed, also the sun in astrology does represent, uh, in some cases, is the physical body and uh, we can definitely see appearance characteristics with the sun sign so people with sun in aries tend to have a wonderful physique and they tend to heal and channel energy through exercise and through um, any type of very strong physical activity so if you're an Aries person and you're uh, feeling kind of pent up or not feeling uh, right about things, uh, reconsider what you're doing physically. Reconsider uh, the way that you're channeling energy and are you channeling enough energy physically. When this sign gets like too in the mind or too involved in mental pursuits without some kind of physical outlet, that can be a time when the sun and Aries energy can get really, <laughs> um, you know, temperamental and unrestrained. So this sign does have a legendary temper, kind of like the sun sign of Scorpio. Both are traditionally ruled by the planet Mars. And when you combine the energy of the sun and Mars, you get uh, this, which is basically uh, an abundance of life force energy. Both Aries and Scorpio have this, but especially Aries, it's more at the surface, it's more positively utilizable for Sun in Aries as well. Um, so if you've been born, uh, if you yourself are a Sun in Aries person, um, it's good to know that basically a lot of your incarnation deals with physically channeling energy. Um, so any type of long-term goals that are connected to physical uh, activities, so careers in professional sporting, uh, military careers, um, anything like coaching or uh, athletics or uh, even like the Olympics or something like that. Uh, these types of goals are very good for the sun in Aries. Um, and it's always good as sun in Aries, okay, to have like mentors around you because this is also the youngest sign of the zodiac. This is the first house. This is the first sign. And uh, with the sun in Aries, sometimes there's a... Uh, propacity 
for uh, being taken advantage of or being um, contracted unfairly because the Aries person is usually so focused on the goal or so focused on the physical aspect of what they're doing that they can sometimes bypass the subtleties of certain things. So for example, being like a professional athlete with a really unfair like manager or someone who really like takes everything from you, um, you have to really watch out for this type of thing with the sun in Aries. Any type of tendency to be taken advantage of. In fact, even Aries people can almost like to be taken advantage of, and hear me out here. Um, it's not nobody likes being taken advantage of, but sometimes it can add to the gauntlet or it can add to the uh, difficult trajectory that they so enjoy embodying the transcendence of. So that's what the archetype of Aries is about. It is um, about physically transcending some type of difficulty or physically overcoming something. Again, it has a relationship with the sign of Scorpio uh, because they're both traditionally ruled by Mars, as I said. Um, so both of these signs can find comfort with each other, uh, though they don't actually work that great in uh, synastry or, or uh, relationships, but they can really learn archetypally from each other. So Aries needs to really watch out for any kind of stagnation and it needs to be more open to transformation, and it needs to find joy in overcoming difficulties without basically accepting or obligating itself to unnecessary difficulties, if that makes sense. Like, for example, having um, an unfair manager or um, having a partnership or a contract that is known to be unfair and then signed off on and then uh, sort of accepted as some type of uh, athletic uh, prowess or another thing to overcome. So watch out for stacking the difficulties, okay? Uh, watch out for stacking uh, problems to overcome or creating problems. Again, the creative capacity is so strong in the sign of Aries. Um, it's kind of like a sacred masculine energy, okay? That it can also like, create a lot of problems that it never had to face, or it can um, choose the difficult path or choose the harder climb. Um, so one of the uh, soul morals for the sign of Aries is actually um, choosing the easier path or um, making things easier, okay, remitting something, choosing not to participate in something, and really finding and developing a new level of um, deliberation and a new level of ability to discern what is the best way forward because forward, okay, progress is the direction of Aries. It's a cardinal fire sign. So it's like the most quick moving uh, forward motion yang like energy. So um, this sign also does best during the day, during the sunlight. Of course, if you have some type of other placement in your chart, you might prefer nighttime, but it is a diurnal fire cardinal masculine archetype sign. Um, and its animal, of course, is the ram, okay? So the uh, animal uh, totem for the sign of Aries is the ram, which symbolically represents some type of like pushing against or like, um, you know, it has the horns, so it pushes against or it moves into something opposing it. So opposition is within the nature of Aries. Uh, fighting is within the nature of Aries, okay? Um, it does, of course, have rulership over things such as uh, military, things such as soldier archetype, uh, knighthood, uh, things like that. So this is a sign also that, um, kind of like the Five of Wands in the tarot, uh, it needs to have some type of competition, healthy competition. Um, and careers, of course, uh, can be indicated in anything that deals with overcoming battles and anything that deals with, um, you know, basically being victorious. It is the sign of victory and the sun is at home in Aries. So solar energy naturally expresses well. It is lucky to have this sun sign. Moving on. Okay, we have the sun in Taurus. Okay, this is a dark shadowy one. Oh my gosh, if you have the sun in Taurus, Oh no, we have a problem area here. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I love the sun in Taurus. Um, if you've been on my channel for a long time, you know that I tend to give some special time out for my Taurus people because as a Scorpio myself, I um, really relate to them as they are on the same axis as me. So I, I've always learned a lot from Taurus people, both um, here on YouTube and in real life. Um, so the sun of Taurus, it's, it's one of the sun signs that I feel I uh, have had the most experience with. Um, Okay, so we have to be really careful with the Sun in Taurus, being that this is the second, eighth house axis, the Taurus-Scorpio axis. A lot of times Taurus people don't know it, 
but they're coming off in a way that they're like unaware of. They have this weird uh, tendency to um, like be unaware of their own darkness until they basically go through some type of existential crisis that can usually happen anywhere from like age 17 to like age 28, uh, most often with like the Saturn return from age 28 to 30, but it happens earlier for some other people. Um, so basically uh, coming to terms with one's own darkness is a big part of the sign of Taurus. So this is the first shadow sign of the zodiac. Um, and that means it's the most youthful shadow yin feminine sign, earth sign, uh, fixed sign. This means that um, it's like youthful shadow, which is kind of a, an irony or it's kind of a, a dichotomy in a way. Um, so basically what this means is that there's this feeling of being caught off guard a lot um, early in life and also a feeling of vulnerability, perhaps being um, taken advantage of. And I think that um, the beauty uh, that is connected to Taurus, because of course, if you've read about this uh, sun sign in Taurus, it does rule over beauty, it rules over, um, you know, any type of abundance and uh, well-being in life in general, it comes as a result of uh, pretty hard stuff. So Taurus people um, can really tend towards spirituality for this reason, because they kind of usually have this incredible abundance that comes from some type of uh, journey through the darkness that only they can really understand. So this sort of like sovereign ability to um, understand one's own shadow or one's own dark side is a very important part of this sun in Taurus because, um, you know, without that, without that connection to the eighth house, without that connection to the Scorpio archetype, uh, basically there are just these like repetitive, like why me experiences. So one of the, uh, shadow sides to Taurus is the sort of, um, uh, cancer can also struggle with this too, but it's like the oblivious, like why me? I don't understand why bad things are happening to me, or I can't like comprehend like uh, why that situation went that way. Like, uh, and and basically this can happen through like manifesting relationships with like dark people, or manifesting, um, or even going through some pretty like harsh stuff, and like waking up on the other side of it, being like, I can't really piece together why that happened again. This is youthful shadow energy, so it's like engaging or experiencing shadow without being able to understand uh, sometimes the greater meaning. So um, it's not that they can't, and I find that many, many Tars, especially after age 30, especially after the first Saturn return, really getting past it, so more like 32 to 35, there's a great, great window during that time to understand why these things happened and understand the greater humanity of them. And I will say first and foremost, as a sun in Taurus, it indicates a major soul level aging up. So it's like the soul through many lifetimes choosing to experience something heavier in order to like age up. It's almost like if I can describe this to you all, uh, you know how as humans we have these like segments of aging so you have like maybe zero to 17 and then you have like i don't know 21 to 28 and then you have like um uh 29 to 34 and, and you know what i mean with these segments okay um the soul also goes through this through many lifetimes and to incarnate as a sun in taurus means that there's a transition point also a sun in scorpio a transition point between these so a cusp of soul aging so if i can put that into context for you all uh, by being a sun in taurus it means that you're going through a major soul transition in this lifetime and, and all of the life is going to be like that and there's a need to make space to honor in a sacred way these transitions so especially if you have a saturn in your natal chart that has a transition oriented nature to it like a saturn in Cancer, Pisces, any water Saturn or placed in a water house, and, and there are other configurations as well, that this really is about getting good with the energy of change and the energy of transition. But what can be hard about the sun in Taurus is that it's a fixed earth sign. It's an enigma, okay? I mean, the entire second eighth house axis is. It's like the energy of enigma. So you're an enigmatic person. You confuse people. You Like, uh, what you see is not always what you get. And, and this really depends on how the rest of the chart is oriented, because there are some Taurus people, okay, where you can't really identify any type of, like, spiritual depth. You know, if there's a lot of Libra, if there's a lot of Gemini, if there's a lot of... Um, 
Leo, you know, it's not that this is the case, but it's it can seem vapid or it can seem shallow uh, at first glance. But then there's a total other sort of species of Taurus people with like a lot of Scorpio Pisces or Capricorn who are very deep and sort of like Sphinx-like or uh, sort of um, like Greek gods or goddesses, you know, it's a very uh, different brands of uh, Taurus for sure. And with Scorpio too, this entire axis has this sort of like uh, triangular or triple oriented manifestation grid. So it's important to know that um, if you are dealing with a Taurus, like if you're not a Taurus, that like within them are many different ways of channeling. And also there are like different kinds of Taurus and Scorpio. There's like um, a more shallow kind. There is a very like deep and enigmatic kind. And then there's also just kind of an artistic kind as well that um, is not so such a deep type of artist. And this is interesting. This is actually something I've never channeled about Taurus before, but this is like this third kind of uh, brand of Taurus person where there is is this like flirtation with depth or there is this contact point via the subconscious through some type of artistic medium like music, painting, art, or um, anything really. Um, and they can't contact it consciously though. Again, the youthfulness of the uh, second sign leads them to on the one hand have this like shadow context by like seeing the deeper psyche and subconscious via art but consciously it won't quite connect. So if you're in a relationship with a Taurus person, especially if you're like a Scorpio or a Capricorn or like a really like deeper shadow uh, mature sign, you have to kind of understand that there's like a limit to like what you're gonna connect to with them. And that while you might be getting this deeper uh, connection with them, there's never gonna be like a deep connecting point after all, because it's like only through art or only through some type of dreamscape that they can actually sink down to this lower vibrational uh, landscape. Um, and this is a certain type of Taurus. Again, there are other Tauruses who can. Like, it's not that every single Taurus is shallow. It's not that every single Taurus is like this. But again, this is an important kind of... Um, uh, it's an important observation about these youthful signs, especially the four to six first signs of the Zodiac that are ruling over the more youthful archetypes of life. And understanding the complexities of being a, a yin, feminine, shadow, earth energy, while at the same time being a very youthful and young, the second sign. Again, this is like the toddler stage. This is like the, um, even I would say pre-five-year-old uh, stage of um, development, if we were to compare it to like the human growth development. So how do you combine these... Um, archetypes, well, it basically manifests for all Taurus as a kind of wavering, uh, some would even say like volatile, kind of psychic, when I say psychic, I mean of the psyche, expression of youth and also shadow. So it's very enigmatic and it is something that needs safety. Okay, as you know, Taurus sun, it rules over security, stability, and abundance. And it has a deep connection to materialism. Again, it's so youthful and it's so young that its transition orientation has not yet adapted or transcended the material plane. So this means that they can't have the trust and energy that Aries has uh, in the way that an Aries can completely detach from finance or detach from the money or the material aspect and just pioneer. Taurus, on the other hand, cannot. Taurus has to be lower in vibration in the sense that it um, connects to the earth material plane in a very sophisticated and secured way while also needing that youthful push forward. So this is a complex and karmically layered archetype that is absolutely beautiful. Careers for Taurus can include art, music, um, academia, even for some of them, uh, especially if it's connecting to those other um, art forms, like especially academia that relates to the arts or relates to um, something that is not so serious. Um, also banking, okay, the monetary system, again, the second eighth house axis deals with the monetary system and it deals with stores of value, wealth, and um, energy. Okay, so there is a potential for the sign of Taurus in um, markets, okay, stocks, 
um, but also doing really well in salaried position. Again, the second house is about uh, salaries. It's about the money we work for. It's not so much about equity, okay? So this is about uh, new money or new influx of income. And um, it's very easy as Taurus once you find the right sphere to like get raise after raise, promotion after promotion, and to really, uh, it's like the soul as a Taurus person needs some type of new connection to um, the monetary realm, or it needs some type of new level of security. Uh, so land ownership is very positive for these people, home ownership, um, anything that is a material representation of security and stability. And you have to really watch out as a Taurus person for engaging in like gambling or any type of like volatile spending, okay? It's uh, not um, at all uh, emphasized with this sign. Okay, so anything that's like Sagittarian, the quincunx, okay, to Taurus, is uh, you have to be careful with. So um, anything that gets you too far out of your body, like hyper philosophical pursuits, gambling, um, you know, anything that's relying on luck, lottery, or uh, vapid things, okay, um, not a good idea for Taurus people. It really needs to be a secure and um, unbreakable foundation that you're standing on or creating in life. Also food, okay, food is connected to the Taurus element, so it's good to take cooking lessons. That's a great way to transcend as a Taurus person. It's also really good to um, grow through architecture or grow through any type of building style. Uh, careers in architecture are also really positive for this sign. And the uh, most difficult thing for Taurus, okay, the uh, most, um, the most important as well uh, transitional element is the theme of forgiveness. Okay, so it's very hard for this sign to forgive. Uh, again, it's second, eighth house axis, but they have to if they want to uh, level up. So that's like the karmic thing for Taurus is like the whole forgiveness thing. Um, and it really does um, generate the crossroads of like moving forward or not. Okay, it's the theme of forgiveness. So um, moving on. Gemini, sun sign of Gemini. I'm so excited to be uh, reading for you all and talking to you about your sun in Gemini. Or if you're perhaps somebody who is not a Gemini sun, trying for your life to understand a little bit about this uh, very sometimes confusing sign, welcome, welcome to the entire population. Um, I can guarantee you that if you are a sun in Gemini person that you have all other 11 signs watching right now because they <laughs> don't know how to proceed. Okay, so Gemini, it's like a uh, disruptor. Okay, the sign like kind of exists to like disrupt things, kind of like Aquarius. All of the air signs, especially Gemini and Aquarius have a sort of like disruptive element and it's like the archetype of um, disruption or some type of interruption or some type of uh, chaos, okay? Um, so welcome to the energy of chaos that is Gemini. Um, yes, I love this sign. Um, as a Scorpio myself, it can be a hard for me to... Um, uh, but what I've learned, okay, um, and this is an outside perspective, okay, Geminis, again, I, I um, will try my best. So Sun in Gemini, it means... Uh, that you have the ability to communicate like no other sign, okay? And uh, it's kind of like people who want to deem themselves good communicators get very upset with uh, Geminis because they uh, can easily become jealous, I think, of Geminis. And, and also, like, nobody can really sell anything to a Gemini, you know what I mean? It's like uh, the crown has been taken or the um, <laughs> by the Gemini, or the uh, selling of ice to the Eskimo has already been done by the Gemini. So basically, if you have a Gemini in your life, it means that they can't really be swayed or manipulated easily. I mean, of course, anybody can be. It's like not that one sign cannot be done any anything, you know? It's like, um, but for Geminis, they're particularly difficult to sway or manipulate, but at the same time, they're not really stubborn either. I mean, unless there's other things in the chart. So it's kind of a very impossible energy if you think about it. It's like, uh, it's sphinx-like, it's difficult really to label or uh, term in any very specific way. And for that reason, it can't really be packaged up or it can't really uh, be confined very easily. Again, this is like mutable air energy. So it's impossible really to define it completely. And that leads a segment like this to be something that you could either like talk for hours about or um, shortly about. But 
Um, what I will say is due to being ruled by Mercury, it means that there has to be like some type of quick moving energy. If you're a Gemini and you're puzzling for a really, really long time about any one thing, I feel like that isn't necessary. And I think that you can basically just think quickly or act pretty quickly and see just as good of a result. Um, I think of language. I think of communication. I think of um, also needing to speak quickly. You guys have heard me talk about before as I've studied quite a bit of foreign language. And I had a great foreign language teacher once who told me that, um, you know, the quicker that you speak the language, the more apt it is to sound uh, fluent because uh, typically the brain kind of um, naturally parses the syllables in a way that uh, the language does because the language has adapted in a way that is like, you know, most connected to the mouth and the brain. So um, sometimes the quick moving or the or the faster pace really does lead to a better result. So fast paced results is partly what Gemini has rulership over. And people with the sun in Gemini have a strong karmic uh, relationship to speed and to moving quickly. So what do you need to do quickly in your life as a Gemini? Also, I'm um, not lingering too much. Any type of stagnation, any type of second guessing, two mindedness, is the karmic tender point of the sign of Gemini, because of course this sign is represented by the twins, it is represented by the theme of duality. So what's really hard for Geminis and what a lot of them you know, don't express to others is that they really struggle with um, being able to see two sides of a situation. And I use the word struggle kind of um, choicefully here because it's not that it's like hard for them, but it is. <laughs> this is like the duality of the sign. Like they kind of know inherently both results and this is similar to libra as well they kind of know both sides of a situation they can see both uh, sides like like for example if you think of two different actions or two different um choices jim and i can very easily see what the long-term implications of those would be this is kind of like a sixth sense for them or seventh sense for them um and that can be a hard cross to bear, like being able to see long-term impacts before they happen or being able to kind of, you know, very, very good for psychic energy actually for Geminis. Um, and it's not even quite psychic. It's more like just a good correlation to physics or a good understanding of how issues snowball or how things will be. And this can become like either their best, um, like their best tool, or it can also become quite a hindrance to them as well, depending, because that can be really paralyzing for some people to have that ability, because when you really know long-term momentums or when you really have an eye for uh, the way that things will build over time, it leads you to kind of not want to commit to that much and to not be weighed down by that much, because you kind of learn the secret about life that anything over a long period of time basically starts to decay or it starts to become really heavy the more that an energy builds or the more that an energy weighs down or is contributed to. So for this reason, Jim and I um, may not have traditional careers, okay? May not want traditional careers, may not want anything too earthly, too material based. And for this reason, they like uh, careers in digital pursuits, okay, cryptocurrency, um, any type of currency, anything that's not too heavy, paper, okay, um, writing, um, books, uh, ebooks, all right, um, you know, social media, uh, all of this is really, I would say, arguably ruled by Gemini and Aquarius, all of the air signs to a degree. It's like the air economy, right? Any type of careers in the air economy, any type of careers in um, air element ruled stuff, um, airplanes flying, uh, crossing borders, moving different places. This is of course ruled by Gemini because this is the ninth third house, third house as axis. It shares a lot of commonality with the sign of Sagittarius. So um, academia, uh, travel, learning, but it's not quite the same as it is for Sag. So for Sag, there's a lot more, I suppose, like patience there. <laughs> and with Gemini, it's more of like um, what I want to call, um, uh, how can I distinguish it? For Sagittarius, this is a very time-consuming, like lifelong type of learning. And it's not that Gemini is deprived of that, but they want a quicker type of knowledge or they want more of a um, fast-moving knowledge as well. So the um, 2000 pages of like Greek literature might not really do it for Gemini. They might like a quicker summary. And because of that, they are kind of like bypassing or cutting corners in a way, but also they can then rack up a greater 
I suppose, body of understanding by having that quicker pace. So it's not that either is um, better than the other. But um, with Gemini, you might want to really summarize things, okay? You might want to really cut things down or try to simplify, all right? And um, within the Gemini archetype is the energy of simplification. Um, if you think of algebra, being able to simplify, algebra is a great way for Gemini <laughs> to um, channel their energy or the energy of algebra. So the energy of simplification, the energy of taking a complex formula and getting rid of all of that complexity. Um, so if you think of Sagittarius, it would be like taking the simple formula and making it huge and expansive with thousands of characters. Okay. And then Gemini would be the opposite. It would be like pulling it down and taking it to that simple formula again, basically expansion and retraction. So this is all kind of just a good dialogue about the sign of Gemini. It's going to want a simplified layout and it's going to want to not have that much weight. Okay. So it's going to want to really have a lighter body of experiences. And, um, you know, there, there's this whole kind of, uh, archetypal, uh, dual personality thing with Gemini as well, uh, where they have, it, it, you might hear one person talking about a Gemini. So if, if you take two people that know a Gemini, same Gemini, they will both recount different people, okay? Um, it's hard for them to really carry any one identity or any one um, characteristic because uh, people will see them differently and people will interpret them differently. Um, so for this reason, they can actually have a hard time with like a traditional circles or any type of like status quo circles where it really relies on like one construct of identity or one person being like talked about over and over again. That's very exhausting to Gemini. Um, so they tend to be seen differently by different people and to be recounted differently by different people. Um, there tends to be this very humanitarian side to them. And then also there can be a dark side to Gemini as well. Um, and that's something that they have to like really go through. You know, there tends to be a dark story or a very existential crisis that happens to Gemini. And um, it can be a very chaotic sign. And I feel like most Geminis watching this can relate to this. Like either as a Gemini, they either have transcended this or they have um, uh, basically moved this energy to be like a new form of healing modality. It's either a healing implement they have that they can then project onto other people or help other people with, or it's a chaotic one. It's either chaos or healing, okay? Uh, and a lot of their life journey deals with karmically transcending that chaotic element or that chaotic twin and uh, turning it into a healing one or allowing it to heal with its chaos or something like that. <laughs> and then there's the other twin that's very like uh, flirty, fun, fantastic, and uh, lighthearted and humorous. So um, yes, that's a little bit about the sun in Gemini. Okay, sun in Cancer. So if you have the sun in Cancer, um, congratulations. This is one of the most empathetic, most emotionally intelligent, most uh, advanced types of sun signs to have. The gut instinct is uh, incredibly honed, um, especially if Mercury is also like conjunct the sun in Cancer, which is uh, very likely. Um, also, the sun in Cancer is just, um, in a lot of cases, very fortunate, and there tends to be like uh, a very steady ground that is walked upon. So living in a really beautiful city, creating really powerful, strong, and um, meaningful memories. Okay, to me, the sun in Cancer is also like getting energy through memories. This sun sign is known to be very sentimental, known to be very nostalgic, and also known to be like uh, very stable, usually. And that can kind of be a tender point with Cancer because actually, because this is the natural fourth house, uh, which is like the time of midnight, okay, it's like the darkest point of the zodiac. That means that um, a lot of what a Cancer sun goes through is not seen and not noticed. So it's very likely that they won't be recognized for what they've done, or also that they won't necessarily be seen to be having a difficult time if they are. So um, this can actually be like a huge uh, benefit for the sun and Cancer person though. Like this can really be channeled in ways that are helpful. So a certain business acumen or certain, um, 
aspects of life where it's a bonus or a good thing to not maybe be as seen or be as like out there. So basically Cancer Sun, like one of the main keys to thriving or doing well for them is basically finding a way that they can like control their own time and money. Okay, so self-employment is really indicated with the Sun in Cancer. Um, also um, working from home, okay? Or if you do like uh, work in an office or um, in a more traditional capacity, it will somehow become home-like to you or you will uh, maybe do better if you bring an object from home or if you um, make it more homey for yourself. Of course, the opposite sign to Cancer is Capricorn. So that means that this axis deals with employment, it deals with reputation, it deals with status, and it deals with um, building and growing. And the way Cancer ties into this is it's kind of like the homemaking aspect of that. So there is no status, reputation, or growth in life without a solid home base. Cancer rules the home, okay? Cancer rules the... Uh, base that you have in your life. Um, so it's interesting, uh, cancers can also be known to move around a lot. So this aspect of home, this aspect of a central base, uh, some type of sanctum in their lives um, is really what a lot of Sun and Cancer's experience revolves around. So um, also the relationship with parents, okay? So the relationship with the maternal figure usually, but it can also be the father, depending on which is the nurturing par parent. You usually see uh, the nurturing parent on the fourth house and then the more disciplinary or uh, stern parent on the 10th house. Um, so um, there are a few different kinds of cancers, okay? Um, all of the water signs have quite a variety, and all of the signs do really, but um, especially like Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces, there's a lot of variety, and um, I doubt that I can encompass it all in this short segment. You know, I could probably um, write a book about it, but um, okay, so I'll try to break this down pretty quickly. So there's one type of cancer, like, so if you're like on the outside looking in, if you're like dating a cancer, or if you're... Um, not a cancer, um, there are a few things that you can observe that can really tell you how healthy or not this person is, because it's very hard to tell who they really are. Again, this is like a shell, you know, you can sometimes be dealing with a shell, you can sometimes um, also be dealing with like, um, uh, it can be hard to really see the truth, okay? Um, so the way that a cancer will show you who they are is through their relationship with their parents, okay? And this is actually kind of true for everybody. This is kind of like a human thing, but I think that the Cancerian archetype is what really demonstrates this. So if you wanna see who this person is, um, look to how they speak to their mother especially, or um, to the way that they regard uh, their parental figures, okay? Oftentimes, that is a really demonstrative way to see the um, real essence of uh, who a Cancer is. Um, so there are a lot of tender points here in this thing, because the there, there's uh, a, whole, a whole book, really, to write about the uh, parental structure in regards to the Cancerian archetype. But in my uh, short amount of time here, I will say that, uh, first of all, can Cancer rules over orphanages, and it rules over uh, foster homes as well, and as I was saying, like homes in general. So, um, but again, family homes. So not like um, other types of like homes where it's like a nursing homes or hospitals, that's Pisces, that's not cancer. Um, but like homes where families are and families have private control of the home, that's what cancer rules over. And that is always a big arc for them. Okay, the family home, the, um, the healing from the events of the family home, okay? Um, oftentimes, cancers have either been foster parents or have been uh, in foster care, okay? And of course, certainly not all of them. Or there, even if they didn't, there might have been a feeling that they were like abandoned from early on or not really supported or not maybe even given like the proper health care by the parental figure. So um, primarily, um, you know, there might not be a red flag in 
a cancer, for example, having a negative relationship or even an estrangement with the family member, it might have been warranted, but it's really important to deconstruct this, whether you are on the outside looking in or whether you are a cancer, okay? Especially if you're far into adulthood now and have your own independence or have your own um, capability. Are we still living as like a 14 year old person um, psychologically in regards to our parents? It's really good to get that stuff up to date as a cancer because that is really a lot of where the leverage of cancerian energetic um, capacity is. So um, yes, again, if you're on the outside looking in, uh, I would say if you're like dating a cancer, okay, and they um, can't even speak to their mother, that is a red flag. Um, but you know, maybe it's uh, warranted, you never know. But um, if the cancer has a really good relationship with their parents, or if they've been able to achieve a certain state of like understanding or empathy for the parents, that's really the important thing. Um, uh, relationship aside, can they empathize with why or where their parents were? Because um, that is a big part of trauma healing, okay, is um, empathy for other people involved in a traumatic scenario, and sometimes that's not possible. Again, this is like another video or another book for another day. Um, but uh, yes, we need to really see for cancer people that we really uh, work a lot to transcend some of these familial karmic wounds. And um, if you have a very fortunate cancer placement like Jupiter Sun conjunction, yes, it does indicate a wonderful family or a beautiful inheritance or like uh, really just having everything uh, maybe arranged for you by a parent, even if there is drama there, you know, um, really cancer Sun is a blessing uh, when it comes to family. The family has always given something invaluable to a cancer son, even if that's a bad situation, okay? And the cancer son will only uh, self-deprive if they try to continue convincing themselves or live in a never-ending cycle that their difficulties from early on will continue to haunt them, okay? So they have to really turn it into their own empowerment and eventually find empathy and resolve there. And that's how you know that you're with an incredible cancer or that you're uh, connecting to somebody with really strong, formidable cancer, cancerian energy is um, can they forgive and also can they overcome themes of abandonment, either being abandoned or abandoning other people? Because the uh, sign of cancer also rules uh, disappearances, abandonments, and um, closing. Okay, so empty houses, vacancies, uh, stores closing down. Uh, that is ruled by Cancer as the opposite sign to Capricorn, which rules uh, business and uh, healthy structures. So um, this is uh, imbued in uh, the Sun and Cancer to maybe restore. Uh, so to like restore vacant houses, okay, to renovate houses, to like uh, rebuild businesses, to to be able to like use the uh, very watery and uh, purifying energy of cancer. Cancer is a purifying and a cleansing energy at the end of the day um, to go into the stagnant and undo that really is where this sign is powerful. And again, it's like cardinal water, right? So it's like a fast moving stream, like a barreling flooding stream actually. And you can't really swim against that current. So again, the main issue for sun and cancer, right? Is to not stagnate. Okay, and to re really with emotional issues, parental issues, because again, the family is such a long running thing, like these things like, you know, the family is kind of a lifelong experience. And for that reason, it can be prone to stagnating. And that's why there's so much issues here in the fourth house in the Cancer energy, because Cancer is like cardinal water, it's like a barreling, flooding uh, stream with a really strong current. So it just has hangups when it comes to stagnation with the family. And um, I will say relationships with cancers are very, um, uh, they ebb and flow a lot. Again, this is ruled by the moon. This sign is ruled by uh, lunar energy. So it changes like daily and it, but it does have a overarching cycle within its changes. But if you're someone who like can't handle the constant ebbing and flowing, uh, it's probably going to be difficult to uh, get along with cancers. And also cancers can be, um, what's the word? They can be solitary as well as can sometimes Capricorns, especially if there's both placements in the chart, Capricorn and Cancer. It can mean independence, again, self-employment, solitary living, and also just really sweet, sweet healing and wonderful like bedside manner people. Okay, so also like careers in nursing, careers as like in the medical profession, in uh, anything there might also be really good because they're so comforting. Like to have a cancer near you if you're going through an illness, for example, 
uh, you'll be thankful for the rest of your life if you have a cancer near you during a time of illness or struggle. Like that's something that you will never forget. And it's something that might uh, be the difference uh, between life and death for some people. So uh, having a cancerian person in your life uh, during trial and uh, tribulation is um, a great, great uh, gift from God. And uh, Scorpio is kind of like this, not quite in the same way that Cancer is. Scorpio is more like uh, the psychologist that comes into your life at a difficult time, or the like, uh, even catalyst or um, really uh, kind of more pointy energy that comes in during transformation or difficulty, whereas Cancer is more like the medic or the nurse or the um, or the best friend even. And if you have had the uh, great fortune to be around uh, someone with cancer, son who is highly evolved and doesn't have like a lot of like a red flag issues, uh, really cherish them. Um, and then also, if you are with a cancer who uh, maybe has the more volatile side of the sign, uh, this is an important sign as well because it says maybe that you have this too. Again, if we think of like law of attraction, or if we think of um, you know the way that people come together, um, you know they will be demonstrating some type of issue within you and, and you to them, uh, kind of like mirroring, you know? So um, it's kind of like a mirror sign, okay? The fourth house, Cancer Energy Pisces is also kind of like this too. It's um, going to constantly show you yourself because Cancer rules over the self. And um, again, if you have Cancer Sun, try to just enjoy the more youthful parts of life. Try to, because again, we're still quite young and, and that's the harsh thing about this sign. There's just a harshness in all of the water signs, but also many perks to having this harshness or many bonuses or, or uh, nice aspects of uh, the difficulty. You know, things really even themselves out uh, in, in general. Um, but yes, if you're a Cancer Sun, um, I always recommend when I'm working with Cancer Sun clients, you know, walk ourselves off the ledge a little bit. Let's uh, retreat a little bit into some of the more youthful aspects of life, games, fun, enjoyment, happiness, uh, communion, family events, um, even inherited family, making new friendships. When things start to get heavy and crazy, when things start to like go wild and and um, problematic, sometimes we just have to like kind of walk it back or we have to uh, step away from those things quickly because cancer, once it goes into a shadow period or once it goes into like a um, volatile dynamic this can be one of the most volatile signs in the zodiac um so um that makes it a very interesting puzzling uh personality though doesn't it this combination so anyway let's move on okay sun and leo i always uh, whenever i do a segment of uh, through the signs i'm always uh, really interested in how much the energy changes from cancer to leo it's like such a shift in paradigm um so what do you need to know about the sun in leo um this is one of the best placements for the sun of course, the sun has a rulership over Leo, and um, it is best placed in this sign. So if you have the sun in Leo, you need a lot of sunlight, okay? Um, it's good to be activated or uh, working during the day. Um, even things that put you into the sun or things that uh, get sunlight onto your skin is very, very important as a sun in Leo. If you have a sun in Leo or even Leo rising, okay, um, vitamin D deficiency will be the difference between like whether or not you have an easy or hard life. Um, it does indicate needing to be uh, more solarly activated. So sun in Leo, it needs a lot of um, day-oriented people, experiences, which means basically a bit of a detachment, again, the opposite sign being Aquarius. Um, detachment from overly emotional or overly complicated, overly problematic areas of life is essential for Sun and Leo. So if you're surrounded by super psychological, um, super, I don't know, adept or cunning people, I don't know, you might become very politically powerful. You know, it's like a Scorpio plus Leo is a very strongly powerful combination, but it's also very inharmonious and incompatible. So um, you might uh, watch out for Scorpios, but at the same time, it's like weirdly empowering. But um, I see that Leos are most happy when they're not having to overthink things, when they're not having to puzzle, when they're not having to do complicated things. So if your life has you, um, you know, puzzling, scheming, thinking about complex things. You might consider delegating things like that to a Scorpio, or you might, um, I don't know, uh, find yourself 
uh, not as healthy, happy, or wise having to be in that place. So um, again, Leo is the sign of royalty. Leo is the sign of the lion. It's like king of the jungle vibes. Um, so this means you'll like manifest a lot of people around you. You might manifest a lot of helpers. You might manifest a lot of like, like naturally whenever you enter a place or whenever you start a certain project, people like crowd around or people uh, will kind of orbit around you. Um, so therefore the sun in Leo is one of the most egotistical placements to have as well. So if you're on the outside looking in, you might never be seen by a Leo sun. You might never be noticed. You might, um, even if you're face to face having a conversation with them, they might not uh, ever remember that it happened. So there's a major self focus with Sun and Leo. And um, this isn't that bad, okay? Because this is the best, uh, or certainly one of the best expressed solar energies. So the Sun and Leo is um, never really going to lose, okay? So you might as well not stop start battles with them. <laughs> this is uh, probably very ego stoking for um, certain Sun and Leo people watching. Um, and certainly there have been historical figures with the Sun and Leo who have uh, lost, but they are certainly a rarity. Um, and uh, generally speaking, you might as well not try. So if you are like cross-watching or if you have like, um, I don't know, uh, Leo enemies, that's not a good thing <laughs> because uh, you don't really want to cross this sign. Um, this, uh, along with Taurus, Scorpio, and Aquarius, all of the fixed signs are uh, problematic to be um, in a conflict with. So um, why does Leo experience so much conflict in their lives? Um, well, they don't have to, but they do experience it. It's kind of like, I don't know, you know, like kings and queens of the uh, ancient world always had some type of battle or some type of conflict or some type of exercise that showed them being um, threatened to be like dethroned or threatened to be like replaced. Okay, so there's this sort of... Um, archetypal or instinctual fear within every Sun in Leo that people are trying to like come for them or people are trying to like replace them in whatever they do. Um, so this is why they always have like people around them. They usually have like good advisors, lawyers, doctors, like uh, they have the infrastructure, okay? It's sort of like almost like a God-given type of thing for Leos, Leo rising, fifth house people. They're going to be naturally blessed with an orbit of people so you don't want to really challenge that i suppose unless imagine like two sudden leo people like battling it out i don't know that that's probably happened a few times in history i'm not sure but um what is important for the sun in Leo is also to know like who you're attracting in and who is orbiting so there's a very big possibility to have like illusions or weirdness with like the people that are like orbiting around you or the people who are um there so it's always really good for Leos to take stock about like, who are they investing in? Okay, who uh, does your court comprise of essentially? Who is um, there? Because uh, you never know if that person is like uh, real or not, or you never, uh, you never know if they're um, loyal. So loyalty is the major theme, loyalty, honor, uh, prowess, uh, pride. Sometimes in the shadow, it's arrogance or um, wrath or, uh, you know, all of the fixed signs really struggle with like these like seven deadly sin vibes and they do kind of have a representation over them. So Leo can also be very um, destructive in the shadow and you will know it like if you are in a conversation or in a relationship or in a, in any type of bond, with a toxic or um, maladapted Leo, it's important to run for the hills. And there's no need to partake in the battle. There's no need to try to like get one up on them um, because that just feeds them, okay? So like a Leo, and this is an interesting kind of like shadow component of Leo. Imagine trying to like launch a battle with the sun, okay? You can't do that. The sun always wins. But at the same time, it kind of feeds on that which is launched against it or that which is done against it. So you can actually win, and this is a little secret, by just detaching or um, sort of like surrendering. So if you're in like a problem with the Leo, just like surrender and move on with your life because that's never gonna go well. 
Also, um, as a working astrologer for many years, when I was uh, working with uh, so many different clients, you guys don't know how many clients I dealt with who were basically like in a battle in all different shapes and forms with another Leo. It's always, there's always a Leo or a Scorpio who's on the other side of some type of major dispute or conflict. And both of those signs, and to a degree Taurus and Aquarius too, but especially Leo and Scorpio, if you're like facing off with them, like just move on, okay? Um, there's no need to like go through it or there's, <laughs> I'm kind of like kidding here, but um, there's something about Leo that's just confrontational, okay? There's something about Leo that also won't like really go down either. So they're kind of like surrounded because of their orbit, because of what's orbiting around them. It's like everything in the orbit goes before the Leo. So you're not probably going to see your efforts like towards a Leo really ever pan out towards them. It's like it ripples or it ricochets or it, it it's a very, it, this is why it has rulership over kings and queens because they had to be adept and capable and sometimes not totally above board, okay, to maintain that. Um, so celebrities tend to be ruled by Leo, politicians, um, any type of, you know, high parts of the societal structures and pyramids have tended to have rulership over uh, Leo, uh, Scorpio, and Capricorn, those three signs especially, and also Taurus to an extent. Um, those four signs uh, are the basically the what I would say I don't know if dominant is the right word but in the earthly like worldly sense it has traditionally been those signs that tend to like really like dominate society which does make them like dangerous um, in their shadow forms and it's not all of those signs again we have different vibrational levels of every single sign which is another video for another day but um Sun and Leo um, if it could just overcome like cancer, the childhood trauma, okay? And we don't talk about this very much for Leo, but it's also a sign that has rulership over childhood trauma and childhood wounds. And this, uh, whereas cancer like isolates or withdraws to deal with that, Leo does the polar opposite. It climbs or it um, manifests its ego outward in some type of like hierarchy in order to cope with it. So, um, yeah, the best way is to just like deal with it head on or to transcend these like hierarchical problems because that's becoming really problematic this day and age and it's not going to really um, be what it used to be. But bringing this down to more like a simple things, uh, of course, Leo rules over uh, feline energy, cats. So these people tend to love cats. These people uh, tend to uh, maybe have multiple cats. And um, also, as they walk through the streets or um, as they go places, you will see that somehow cats approach them. So, um, interestingly, I, I personally have Leo rising and I can't get away from the cats. They always somehow find me um, everywhere that I go. And uh, comment below if you're a Leo and you can't get away from the cats. Okay, moving on. Um, sun in Virgo. I'm just writing down this timestamp. You guys can imagine the trial that it is to keep up with these uh, long videos. Um, so, Sun in Virgo, this is a transition point to like teen slash young adulthood slash adulthood in a way, um, that whole segment of uh, soul energy. So we have aged a little bit, a little bit with the Sun in Virgo. This is the inherent energy of like the uh, goddess energy. This is um, also symbolized by the Virgin, the Virgin Goddess. So like in Catholicism, uh, the Virgin Mary would be a great uh, symbolism for the sign of Virgo. Um, and then also there is the archetype of the Virago, which is like the uh, militant queen, which also um, is currently even more activated by Virgo because... And this is a really crazy dynamic, but we have Regulus, the fixed star, having moved into the sign of Virgo, which means that kingly, queenly energy that used to be occupied by Leo is now in Virgo. So this means that the ruling class is now Virgo ruled. So that means we have a highly legalistic, highly bureaucratic, highly administrative and feminine matriarchal society that we will be in for the next few thousand years. Um, <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so that is in Virgo. It's still on the cusp. It takes a very, very long time for these fixed stars to move. I'm talking like millennium type of stuff here. Um, but uh, yes, we are in the worldly uh, chapter of Virgo. We are in the universal chapter of Aquarius. We're in the age of Aquarius. But as for like a 
the um, energy of hierarchy represented by Regulus, the fixed star. That is in Virgo. Um, so uh, Virgo people, that means that you can very easily uh, get really far in life um, because you're naturally supported by the energy of Regulus. Um, more about Virgo just at a mundane level. Um, so Virgo, this is ruled by the sixth house, which is routines, um, not in the way that Cancer was routines, like natural routines, natural cycles, lunar cycles. Virgo is human imposed routines. So uh, cleaning routines of the house. Um, also things like calendar routines. So for example, like um, <clears throat> tax deadlines, you know, human imposed routines. Uh, April 15th is tax day. That's a Virgo-y type of thing. Um, uh, and um, any other types of like bureaucratic routines. So like, um, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. So like registrations, um, businesses, um, annual or quarterly reports, um, you know, uh, data measurement, because the sign after Virgo is Libra, right? So that's where we weigh the, the data, but Virgo produces the data. So um, great careers for a Virgo person include like um, accountants, uh, data management, um, you know, any type of uh, reporting or administrative services for like uh, public service or, um, yeah, in fact, some of you might be interested to know that in a deep traditional astrology, so like um, elected or unelected uh, public service positions are actually ruled by Virgo. Um, so it's not quite as grand as we think it is, but because Regulus is there now, I suppose it now is, but um, <laughs> um, the uh, sixth house in Virgo rules over uh, not so much like, um, you know, like figureheads, but like the actual administrators or the actual people who um, sort of like middle management, but not even that because Regulus is there now. So it's like middle management rulership, honestly. <laughs> Um, but uh, yes, Virgo is also the natural world and humans connecting to the natural world. So there's this one part of Virgo that's like, um, yes, a human imposed uh, cycles, themes, and routines. But then there's another side of Virgo that is like pure nature and pure like feminine, adaptable nature. So being able to adapt to nature, it makes me think of um, ancient uh, pagan groups uh, being very Virgo ruled, actually, as they sort of like lived um, in the earth or with the earth and were able to adapt to it in less of an imposing way. Um, you know, perhaps there's an interesting idea to think about the transition of Regulus from Leo to Virgo and also the transition from more of a ground based society to like a skyscraper or a very implemented society. To me, that is an interesting millennial shift of, Virg of Regulus from Virgo to Leo, but again, kind of another video for another day. But this is important to know about the Virgo sun as well, because these people will probably be like architects or builders or, um, you know, really take things from the ground up. And they are very connected to nature. All right. So in a way that the air signs might not be so connected to nature, you know, more connected to the human mind or the um, logistic ideas also with like data or routine or measurements. For Virgo, it's more of a nature-based consideration or it's more of an earth-based consideration. Um, Virgo also has rulership over the natural disaster of earthquakes, okay, mutable earth, moving earth, landscaping, um, anything that shows earth moving, landslides, okay. Um, so while this does look like a very beautiful, you know, um, you know, ground connected energy it's also very powerful and it's um, more temperamental i think than a lot of astrologers talk about and it's also more archetypal and more uh grounded in a way that is very powerful so if you're a virgo sun person um, know that your solar energy is expressing through what I've just talked about. And that means that there's a lot of energy to tap into. There is a lot that needs to be channeled as well. Um, I, I would definitely encourage you to research the Virago. That's V-I-R-A-G-O. Virago, it's a sort of certain, certain archetypal like goddess, like military theme. Uh, and that to me is a very accurate representation of what uh, the Virgo sun 
is now. Okay, so uh, moving on, let's talk about uh, the sun in Libra. Okay, sun in Libra, welcome. We're halfway through the zodiac now, or a little bit more than halfway. Technically, we were at Virgo at the sixth house. Okay, so now we are getting into maturity. Okay, we're really into adulthood now with the sign of Libra at the soul level. Um, so the sign of Libra is the halfway marker to me. I mean, Virgo technically is, but by the time we've gotten to Libra, it's like we know that we've passed the halfway point. We're at the seventh house, which is the first house that really starts to deal with other people. So the first six houses, the first six signs are really all about the self and all about the individual. And then once we hit the seventh house and we move through the 12th house, we start to deal with the collective and greater groups and greater connections and relationships. So the sign of Libra, if you have sun in Libra, is about vitality through relationships. So um, networks, um, even uh, friendships, acquaintanceships, and enemies. Again, the seventh house in uh, traditional astrology was the sign of open allies and open enemies. So um, the sign of Libra is the first part of the zodiac also where we see uh, detractors or we see uh, people being against us. So sometimes sun and Libra people are great like uh, at politics or great at any type of um, you know alliance forging or like uh, enemy forging and uh, working through all of those systems is what Libra is all about so this is sign is very empathetic about like the nature of relationships like uh, generating the status of a relationship or generating the status of any type of uh, connection is what the sign of Libra is about. It's the scales, right? So the sun in Libra means that you're a relationship expert. It means that you're um, really good, not just at human to human relationships, but human to earth, human to universe, human to institution, human to uh, business, all of these different entities. Uh, Libra is a, sun in Libra is an expert at understanding where those relationships stand. And that's what makes Libra so powerful. Um, on the world stage and also it makes Libra really struggle with like the mundane day-to-day -day stuff so like um, oddly enough I see that Libras tend to struggle quite a bit with finances or tend to struggle quite a bit with having any type of like status quo um, ease in their own right and if you do have uh, ease here as a Libra it's coming from another place in your chart so if you've got like a Saturn in Capricorn or if you've got um, you know placements in your chart that say otherwise that might be the case but Libra Sun is actually notorious for having to like borrow from other people or having to like take out loans or being in debt. Um, again, this and Scorpio, seventh and eighth house both rule over debt and um, any type of leverage or any type of um, other people's money. This is actually more so Scorpio, but I've seen that it really also manifests through Sun and Libra as well. So um, paying off debt is a big part of Sun and Libra. Um, also, you know, growing through it as well so you can see leverage working really well for them you know like deficit financing i'm not recommending that but i'm saying like sun and libra can say like you know good capability with business and working with that um also sun and libra can be really good at um, obviously maintaining balance it rules over balance it's like the temperance archetype in the tarot and kind of like the justice archetype as well so careers in law careers in finance careers in um uh, any type of judicial work or anything like that is uh, very possible for Sun and Libra. And it's what the sign actually has rulership over, so making decisions. Uh, because of the expert empathy towards relationships as their own entity, so this is an interesting thing, it's what I've learned through the, through, uh, the Libra archetype, is that there are actually like three entities in relationships. So if you have like two people, there's like each of the people and then there's the greater energy that their relationship synergy generates and that be kind of starts to have a life of its own uh, for those of you who are married it's like you understand that like who you're married to um, when you're with that person there's a totally new energy that has formed and then you both kind of have like your own personalities right or your own life force energy and when you're separate that might be more visible but you also see this in business you know you see this in um politics you see this in any type of relationship hierarchy where relationships or the bonds between them actually have a life of their own or have a certain uh, quality or personality of their own. So as a son in Libra, it means that you have expertise in this area. 
Also, um, Sun and Libra, you have a rulership over parts of the body that uh, create balance or do filtration, so the kidneys. Um, also, to a degree, digestion, it's more so Scorpio and Virgo, but Libra has a little bit in the sense of like things being weighted or scaled or, or measured out. Um, and then also like portions, okay, portions of food, what types of food you eat. So Sun and Libra, it's important to have a well-apportioned diet, budget, all of that stuff to be at all functional. Um, also really paying attention to the filtering aspects of the body and the home. So like air filters, any type of like water filtration, this is what your sign has rulership over. In fact, the sign of Libra is like the filter of the Zodiac. So um, yes, you can really be successful also in areas of life that deal with a filtration. Um, so let's move on. Sun in Scorpio. Hi, Scorpios. Okay, so if you have Sun in Scorpio, congratulations, you are probably the majority for uh, viewers of this type of content. Uh, Scorpios love their astrology uh, content, so um, go Scorpios. Um, anyway, so Sun in Scorpio, this is Sun in Pluto's sign, Sun in the energy of the 8th house. Okay, so this is the prime of life, really. Uh, if we look at the uh, soul age span, you know, we've been kind of going through this uh, progression here. The eighth sign of the zodiac is more than halfway through, but it is still within the uh, youthfulness and still within the prime energy to be totally like a uh, strong force within its essence. So um, the force of the Scorpio sun's essence is really grand and really uh, magnetic, okay? Um, this is a complicated placement to describe because I can't really say that the sun in Scorpio is a good or a <laughs> bad placement. Um, again, it is not debilitated. But it's also kind of like a sign of um, difficulty or a sign of strife. So uh, to be born with the sun in Scorpio means that a lot of your vitality and a lot of your energy comes from the uh, difficult parts of life. So if you've known uh, Scorpios, um, there are a lot of different kinds of them, particularly three different kinds of Scorpios. Um, but most of them, by the time they get past the first Saturn return, past age 30, uh, feel very defined or very connected to their trauma points or to the uh, difficult phases of life that they've had. And uh, to me, the sun in Scorpio, when it's operating in its highest point, is uh, really the uh, most awesome example of the human capacity for change and transformation. So um, if you think you know a Scorpio, you might, but they have many different um, segments of their life, okay? So uh, different chapters, different versions of themselves. Uh, this kind of is like the energy of identity cri crisis or identity chaos, sun in the eighth house, sun in Scorpio. Um, it means, again, that vitality or energy is gained through transformation, gained through um, different expressions, and gained through a fluid sense of identity, a fixed sense of fluid identity. And this is complicated. It's very hard to um, tell a Scorpio who they are. Have you ever tried to tell a Scorpio who they are or tried to, um, I don't know, tell a Scorpio what to do or basically control them? Okay, this is deeper than just uh, being told what to do. This is deeper than just, um, you know, not being very approving of authority. This is more like uh, when you tell someone what to do, you're controlling who they are and what, what they do in some way, and Scorpio will not be controlled. So Sun in Scorpio automatically has a kind of like rebellious or kind of a um, contrarian energy about it. Energy is gained through contrarianism. Energy is gained in some cases through a rebellious streak. Energy is gained, vitality is gained through proving something or someone wrong. So if you're a sun in Scorpio, it seems to me that you've proved a lot of people wrong or that you kind of live to make people wrong. <laughs> uh, that can be a part of sun in Scorpio energy. And it's not for that purpose, but um, for this reason, Sun and Scorpio will sometimes manifest a lot of people who tell them who they are, or try to identify them, or try to have control over them, okay? Especially feminine, uh, female Scorpio suns, 
uh, they can really attract like controlling or narcissistic uh, masculine counterparts. And um, that tends to be a lot of their story sometimes because they have to overcome that and their vitality grows as they overcome that or as they somehow transform within that feeling of control. Um, and then for like male or masculine uh, Scorpio sons, it's um, kind of the same, except sometimes you can see that there's like not so much the relationship component and it can be um, more of a battle with the self. But regardless of uh, masculinity or femininity, uh, Sun in Scorpio does indicate a battle with self or a battle with uh, the way that energy is used. So this is kind of, um, how can I put this? The Sun in Scorpio to me indicates some type of energetic manipulation, okay? Um, or in a higher evolution like energetic mastery, all right? It's not necessarily a manipulation, but themes of manipulation, themes of uh, energy changes or energy maneuvering are definitely seen with this a uh, solar plutonian energy and um it tends to create either like a direct sense of power or something that really humbles itself before that so you can either see like a very strong um, political or religiously powerful scorpio or you can also see like the monk or the nun type of archetype as well with Scorpio. So either you, it's like either the Pope or the nun, you know, both are kind of an emblem of Scorpionic energy. Um, it's either like the celebrity or the carrier, okay? It's kind of like the, um, I don't know, uh, president or the uh, advisor, okay? It can be like either one of these. So it can it can uh, fluidly move between like the center of attention or it can be like right on the outskirts, like behind the camera, okay? That's kind of like usually where Scorpio is. But I mean, um, you see a lot of Scorpios also like on the camera as well or being like front and center. And because of this, because of this like need to be in the proximity of power or projection, it can definitely lead to narcissism. Okay, Sun in Scorpio, also Sun in Leo. Um, all of the fixed Sun signs can lead to narcissism because it fixes the solar energy and tries to like maintain it or um, stick it or you know wield that type of solar energy. Now, not all Scorpios are this way, um, and it's always going to be really polarized. So it's a typically. Uh, extreme sign. So you can, yes, see narcissism with Scorpio Sun, but then you can also see the polar opposite. So you can see like self-abnegation with Scorpio Sun as well. You can see incredible charity. You can see um, also like secret charity. So um, not being known to as a charitable giver, but being perhaps one of the biggest charitable givers and like, like doing it under a pseudonym or something. And, and I recommend that Scorpios do that type of thing. Okay, um, I've really seen that Scorpios do much better when they don't necessarily have to be known for what they're doing or they don't necessarily have to be in the front and center because there's something about Scorpio energy, especially with the sun in Scorpio, that is hard. Okay, it's a hard energy because the sun is not avoidable. We can't not see the sun. But Pluto, Scorpio's ruler, is not visible with the naked eye. So to put the sun in Scorpio, it actually is kind of a, it's a hard energy because um, Scorpio inherently needs to not be seen, but the sun can't not be seen. So it's like a um, difficult crux or a difficult cross that Scorpio has to bear. And there's always going to be some type of humbling, okay? Especially if Scorpios get egotistical or... Um, rub things in other people's faces if they become narcissistic or toxic, uh, Scorpio will be humbled, okay? Um, and also a humble Scorpio is the driver of positive change for society. So I will leave you guys on that. Let's move on. Um, Sagittarius Sun. Okay, welcome Sagittarius Sun people or admirers of Sagittarius Sun as this sun sign has many, many admirers. Um, so I feel like Sagittarius Sun probably 
has to have won the contest for amount of secret admirers. Um, it's a very, very great placement for the sun. All of the fire signs, Aries, Leo, and Sag, the sun loves to be placed here because it's natural, right? The sun is a fireball, essentially. Um, it is best placed in fire signs. And really Sagittarius is its favorite because Aries and Leo are its like traditional mainstays. Like it's at home in Aries and it rules over Leo, but that makes Sagittarius kind of like it's like best friend or it's um, favorite place to be because it's not quite as pressurized as Aries and Leo. And it's also very mature. So this is like mature solar energy. This is, um, this is also uh, kind of, complex for the sun as well. So Aries and Leo are less complex, but Sagittarius brings with it a more layered, uh, more philosophical, more academic, and more structural energy for the sun. Um, also, this is, this mutable fire sign is the transition point from like adulthood into older age. So it's still youthful somewhat, but it is starting to transition into old age. So this is a wizened sun sign. This is a um, prestigious uh, sun sign. So if you're a sun in Sagittarius, there are many opportunities for prestige, the natural ninth house. Um, you can easily be very popular. You can easily uh, be in a high position in society. You can easily um, also attract lovers or attract um, friendships or kinship. Uh, family is naturally easy. Okay, if you have like a lot of family trauma or a lot of family um, difficulty, it's not coming from the sun in Sagittarius placement. Um, and honestly, uh, there are some things that are like too good to be true. Uh, for Sun and Sagittarius people. So living happily ever after, uh, questing after something like that, the perfect marriage, okay? The best paying job, um, multiple successful businesses, success in entrepreneurism, uh, the right investments, okay? Lottery energy, the best tasting food, uh, wonderful pets, okay? Uh, great relationships with children, especially if the Sun is placed like in the fifth house, or if um, you have like the fifth house activated well, or if Jupiter or Venus is placed there or aspect your sun in Sagittarius well, um, it means that you have really um, talented and graceful children. Um, also sun in Sagittarius, uh, luck at winning. So, uh, you know, winning games, uh, a tendency to play games or to enjoy games, uh, very fashionable as well, sometimes a little bit over the top. Okay, uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, very flamboyant energy, the sun in Sagittarius. Um, and because of this, okay, sun in Sagittarius, um, it's a really, really powerful placement for jealousy and envy from others. Um, also, it is possible that nobody will relate to you ever having bad days. And we have to remember that humans are human, right? Like there's no human experience is 100% positive. So the thing about sun in Sagittarius, though, is it really looks like... Um, everything's perfect. So people get quite jealous and also um, people won't really resonate with you not feeling 100%. So expectations might also be really high on you as a sun in Sagittarius. You might be expected to go like 500% instead of 30% like most people in 2022. Um, you might kind of like not really see that you um, have it difficult because of that. Because here's the thing about the Sagittarius archetype. So horses, right, um, have been kind of uh, taken over by people and they, for the most part, exist in bondage. So the difficult part about Sun and Sagittarius is finding things in life that don't create a sense of bondage or don't basically have you under the reins of another person. So we see like um, not quite being at the top sometimes with ninth house energy, right? It's not the 10th house, but it's the ninth house. So this is like being like the second level from the top of the pyramid and that can sometimes be like the worst place in society to be like those like secondary or tertiary places in the pyramid that are like close to the top but not quite there they can either be like the best or worst places to be in society so that's kind of what sagittarius sun is like i mean these can be like really great things or really tough things when it rains it pours with any type of sagittarius energy and when it's uh temperate it's not only temperate it's uh jovial it's um as close to perfect as a human experience can get um i recommend constant laughter for Sagittarius, okay, I recommend um, not taking things too seriously. Um, something good for Sagittarius always 
is um, if things get too heavy, if you feel like ever like persecuted, or if you feel like people are starting to get weird, just get out of there. Okay, go somewhere else, travel somewhere else. You're gifted and lucky through travel, through, um, you know, especially like international travel or uh, going other places. I know that all of that's kind of like on the rocks at this current point, but um, even like uh, intercity travel, okay, different cities or even different sections of different cities. So maybe you're on like the super ritzy side of town and things are starting to get weird. People are trying to, I don't know, take you over or something. Um, move over to the like, um, I don't know, lower middle part of town and see if the dynamic isn't totally different. It's It's good to have connections in all parts of society. And, and Sagittarius is really is about breaking these uh, social construct binding weird society, sociological issues. And it's about um, being different or about uh, kind of demonstrating a certain um, lack of care for, you know, rigid norms. So there's something good for you in not being too bound to one stratosphere or being too bound to um, any one place. Also, uh, your ruling planet is Jupiter, so when you mix the energy of the Sun and Jupiter, again, Jupiter is the biggest planet, gas giant in our solar system, and in fact, it's like uh, there there have been rumors before that it could uh, overtake the Sun, and, and I, I don't think that that will happen, but um, it's a huge energy is what I'm trying to get at. The Sun in Sagittarius, it's like also prone to being very big, like the body, okay? Um, so very tall, um, or any type of like uh, larger features, okay? So huge eyes, um, you know, larger head possibly, okay? A broad shoulders, and also very strong. So like um, really developing the muscles, especially the legs, you know, like horse legs, right? Um, is important. So uh, a lot of athletics, exercise, and uh, competitive sports or even martial arts or anything that also can be like connected with like a military too is good for all the sun fire signs um, and for Sagittarius it might be more like on the strategic side or it might be more on the uh, historical side like learning or understanding the bigger picture of that type of thing but it can also be you know like on the ground as well also any kind of study into like astrology mythology or ancient uh, practices is really important for Sagittarius because it transcends modernity in a weird way. Cancer also does this, um, and uh, Aquarius as well. These three signs can transcend modernity and can really tie things back to like ancient practices and really bring those up to the future. Um, so that's also really a, a good way for Sun and Sagittarius to channel energy. Okay, let's move on. Uh, sun in Capricorn. Okay, Capricorn Sun, um, this is the uh, sign that is naturally ruled by Saturn in the sign of the sun. So um, one of the more difficult sun signs, but uh, certainly jam-packed also with rewards and um, merit, certainly. Um, so Sun in Capricorn, um, this is probably the most stubborn, but also the most hardworking, the most um, capable to have upward mobility, uh, natural 10th house energy in the sun, okay, is really, really uh, powerful and strong. So natural good health, okay? If you have like a bad health or if you struggle with health, it's likely coming from a different place in the chart. Capricorn sun bestows a natural kind of um, immunity, a natural kind of uh, strength of the body, a natural endurance. Uh, basically, you can't get rid of them. You know, they won't move. Okay, they're immovable. They're like, um, uh, it's really hard, you know, if you're like married to a Capricorn person and you have something that you want to do that they don't want to do. That's a really, really challenging place to be. So this is like the energy of challenges. This is the energy of um, never ending work cycles. This is the energy also, this is like boss energy. Okay. This also is kind of like the energy of royalty or aristocracy um, in the sense that it's like an ancient construct that uh, just stays, you know, um, sun and Capricorn, it stays, it's staying power. It's uh, energy, its vitality is gained through consistency, gained through um, hearty health, gained through um, any type of stubbornness. Okay, so these people get energy and get vitality through not being changed or moved by other people. 
um, there's a progress for them or a cardinal move forward. Again, this is cardinal earth energy. There's a progress for them within this immobility or within this structure that they create. Also, this is the tallest energy in the zodiac, the 10th house. It's the uh, top of the sky. It's the apex okay, of the sky. So if you like uh, look straight up, like directly um, parallel to the ground, you would be looking at the uh, 9th, 10th house cusp, the midheaven, uh, which is uh, co-ruled by uh, Sagittarius and Capricorn, the uh, cusp of the 9th and the 10th house. And um, that's where these people are. So that's where they, these people get their energy from, is from up there. Okay, so uh, try to change that. Try to, um, you know... Uh, reach that high, it can be difficult. But these people naturally, if you have Sun and Capricorn, it's naturally very tall, very high, and very well positioned for any kind of um, dominance, for any kind of, you know, it, it's ruled by Saturn for a reason, right? You know, it's not really challengeable. Um, for this reason, they can actually really struggle to um, make lasting relationships because people get intimidated very easily. Um, also, uh, people can't really tolerate them sometimes because they don't want to be stuck or they don't want to um, be told no. Okay, uh, the sun in Capricorn can be like uh, the energy of saying no or of limitation or of restriction of some kind. And also the sun in Capricorn is the best placement for any type of like family leader, for any type also of like uh, public leaders as well. Um, it's a sign of leadership. It is like the uh, top of the hierarchy. Okay, it is the energy that represents control, that represents authority, that represents uh, the yes or no factor, okay? The person or the force that says either yes or no is a Capricorn, especially a sun in Capricorn type of force. Because again, the sun, right, is also the top of the solar system hierarchy, and then Capricorn is the top of the uh, sign hierarchy. So combining these two together is very, very hard to challenge. And um, also, you know, it doesn't mean that every single sun in Capricorn is going to be in an authoritative position. Um, in fact, most of the ones that I've seen in my life are not. But somehow it comes through, and it's something that every single sun in Capricorn, like, has the essence of, okay? Like, uh, they can't be overridden, okay? They can't be vetoed. They can't really be, um, you know challenged on much and if they are or if they are somehow overridden that's very hard for them so this is also one of the more um one of the more egotistical signs of the zodiac along with leo along with scorpio along with um you know even aries taurus okay this is a sign that uh struggles to come to terms with any type of um you know exertion of control upon them by another person they won't tolerate that for very long and they will somehow like retreat oftentimes capricorns like to have their own like autonomous household somewhere in a less inhabited place you tend to find them like off the grid it, either they're in a um, major authoritative position in like the center of an urbane territory or they're off the grid living a completely like independent autonomous lifestyle. Both are actually the same energy because they encompass like a complete sense of authority. And um, they tend to like to pursue any type of independence, any type of independent income, any type of like stocking up or saving or frugality tends to be a part of their nature because they equate that with a greater sense of authority and control over their lives. So um, if you're, uh, in a relationship with a Capricorn, um, they won't tolerate much excessive spending. They tend to be hyper frugal. They tend to be, you know, completely dedicated to reaching certain uh, financial or wealth goals. Um, and also, they're very loyal. Okay, so um, they don't betray people easily. Um, also, they won't tolerate betrayals. But they also don't really like scrutiny and they don't like criticisms, okay? Um, they don't 
uh, on on one hand, there's this like strong loyalty, but if there's a point in time where they're like unknowingly being a harsh or unkind presence in another person's life, they probably won't really hear that dialogue unless they are like a different kind of Capricorn or unless they're very open to this type of thing. Um, they won't very easily hear any type of complaint or any type of um, request to act differently, kind of like Scorpio, kind of like uh, Taurus as well. They are not very open to any form of criticism, okay? Especially because the sun, right, is the ego, regardless of what sign it's placed in. It represents the ego. So when it's placed in Capricorn at the top of the chart, it's um, very rare that it will ever uh, compromise or um, be taken down a notch or settle for anything that's not um, its own will. So this is why a lot of times they uh, prefer to keep to themselves. Okay, moving on, let's talk about Sun in Aquarius. Okay, hi Aquarius, moving pretty quickly through your sign. Um, this is such a, an awesome sun sign because it's like transcended the um, authority construct that Capricorn was in. It's a very rebellious sun sign and also it's like rewarded for rebelliousness or it's rewarded for uh, any type of a uh, different way of doing things. Okay, Sun in Aquarius and Sun in Pisces, both of these last two signs. Okay, because now we've fully transitioned um, actually out of the human experience and into the what I like to call the robots and aliens section of the Zodiac. And here the Sun is there. So um, Sun in Aquarius is like a humorous way forward. It's uh, kind of contrarian. It's unconventional. Um, so unconventional, in fact, that I feel that uh, we see this all around us right now, actually, with the current universal age being that of Aquarius, you know, the AI, the automation, the technology, social media, this is all Aquarian. So if you have sun in Aquarius, it might be really lucrative or really empowering to step into those types of fields, um, or uh, you just need to find a different path forward. So this is the energy of unconventionality. This is also the energy of um, transference. So if you have seen uh, some of my recent content about Saturn in Aquarius, which we have transiting uh, during the time I'm filming this video, um, you would see that a lot of uh, the current energy is about transferring. So taking the energy that you've invested into one thing and um, appropriately placing it in uh, where it needs to be. So that's a lot of what um, the sun in Aquarius is about as well. It's like a vitality and energy through um, sort of a knowledge of how to transfer or a knowledge of how to uh, make things work in different places or to apply things in interesting or unconventional ways. So basically, as an Aquarius sun, the uh, tried and true conventional status quo stuff might not really feel uh, perfectly natural to you because it's almost like what has traditionally been natural or what has been established feels unnatural to Aquarius. And I feel that Aquarius is one of the most uh, fixated change makers in the Zodiac. So the sun in Aquarius will um, lead many people with that placement to want to experience changes, not quite in the same way that Scorpio um, or even Pisces does, but uh, more of a social imbued change. So uh, groups of people coming together, uh, organization of networks, grassroots movements, things like that are very connected to the sun in Aquarius. So as a sun in Aquarius person, you might want to um, connect with like movements that you um, enjoy, or you might want to try to, even if it's not anything like that, like uh, find types of like uh, societies or groups or organizations that um, support causes that you like, and that might be a great way to channel that energy. Also, it's very innovative, okay? So a lot of famous inventors have the sun in Aquarius. Also, a lot of um, uh, noteworthy scientists and um, even doctors and like medical innovators, okay, uh, tend to be Aquarian. There are also some Pisces uh, grouped in there as well. So um, this uh, placement embodies innovation because again, the sun is about expression. It's about, um, you know, career, vitality, and uh, energy sources. So when you mix that with the Uranian, uh, again, Aquarius is ruled by the planet Uranus, 
when you mix Uranus and the sun together, that's like really, really electric, fiery, and uh, it's almost like jolting or jarring. It's shocking in a way. There's a shocking energy about it. So these people in a way can be shocking or they can be messengers of uh, shocking information. I mean, imagine being uh, some of the first people to discover some type of incredible scientific discovery, oftentimes that can be a threat, okay? Because innovation always threatens the status quo because oftentimes status quo is structured around that which is um, a limitation uh, or that which is a threat. So if you discover a solution to a limitation or a threat, that can uh, dismantle the uh, need for a certain status quo established uh, construct. Therefore, the sun in Aquarius can uh, sort of be like deemed like a witchy or uh, a threat to certain constructs, and they can often find themselves even in very microcosmic ways uh, to be kind of like threatening someone's established ideas. Uh, so um, even in you know day to day scenarios, like uh, someone. I don't know, say that you're like checking out at the grocery store or something and the uh, person helping you is like, I'm never going to get out of this. Like, I'm never going to, um, you know, uh, I hate my job. I don't want to do this and I don't know how to get out of it. And then the Aquarian person might know the exact answer for them to like move out of this stuff tomorrow, but it might be like too shocking and jarring in a way. So, um, and sometimes people, like regardless of uh, what context they're in, don't actually want solutions. They want to commiserate or they want to um, really experience uh, being stuck without kind of realizing it. So Aquarius dismantles that whole uh, aspect of the human condition where we want to stay stuck or where we want to be like um, not moving forward in some way. So um, it really is also demanding for people with the sun in Aquarius because like it's a lot of energy for one person to have. It's uh, kind of like having too much energy. Sagittarius sun also has this Scorpio sun to a degree and Gemini sun. Okay. Um, these four sun signs have this sort of um, difficulty of being like over energized or sometimes so much energy that there's like a burning out or a uh, discouragement that can come just from like not really knowing how to channel it. So for Aquarians, any type of like high mathematics, any type of chemistry or uh, quantum mechanics, uh, physics, uh, stuff like that uh, can be a very great area to channel some of that high minded energy. Um, also with the sun in Aquarius, um, it just has to be different in some way. Uh, if you are constantly striving for the status quo or the conventional, that is only an uphill battle for Aquarian people. And they have a lot of natural momentum in uh, more fringe or more niche uh, elements of uh, society. So uh, moving on, let's talk about the sun in Pisces. I can't believe that we are already to Pisces. We're about two hours in. Crazy how quickly time flies when talking about astrology. So, Sun in Pisces, best for last, okay. <laughs> well, I, I personally love Pisces people. As a Scorpio myself, I really have always gotten along with Pisces. Some of my uh, best friends in life have been Pisces people. I know quite a bit about them. Um, sun mixing with the energy of Neptune on the Virgo Pisces axis, 612th axis. This puts the energy of vitality into the feet, okay? Uh, Pisces rules the feet. And um, that means that like the path that you're walking on, uh, the physical ground that you're walking on is very fluid, but also like the most important thing. So um, it's very common for Pisces people, as this is also a dualistic sign represented by two fish. Um, so they can be walking like in the physical and the spiritual world at the same time. They can sometimes be on two paths at once, so you might not know a Pisces fully ever. And if you're a person with Pisces sun, um, enjoy this feeling of mystique that you project or that people experience when knowing you. It's not so much secrecy as it is just that I don't think anybody can really know how many different paths a Pisces is walking on. So you might have like a co-worker friend who's a Pisces, or you might have a um, even a friend or, um, you know, maybe even like a partner uh, who's a Pisces and there's just like this feeling like I don't know what else they're doing or like um, you can't even imagine like what else they involve themselves in. So there's kind of like only th this feeling of like only the Pisces knowing what all they involve in or how many paths 
they're on. Um, and oftentimes you'll see that Pisces have many different areas of contingency. And that's what I recommend if a Pisces sun people are struggling, uh, feeling um, discouraged, drained, or emotionally heavy, like it's very likely for this sun sign, try to just create for yourself contingency. Okay, what else would I do if this didn't work? Um, how else can I express myself? Are there other ways or other means to um, getting where I want to be? Uh, so this is a very flexible sun sign. This is also the elder sign as well. The Not just the elder, but this is like alien almost. This is like uh, the most mature energy imbued with solar energy, which can sometimes conflict a little bit. Again, Sun and Neptune also are not really the most easy combination because it's like the Sun wants to illuminate and clarify and make a very specific type of reality that's not too changeable, whereas Neptune wants a fluid or a changeable, flexible sense of reality. So um, there is a conflict here with this sign inherently, and I find that the way to really target this, and I've seen many Pisces have a lot of success and uh, growing ease in their life, just by having a sense of contingency, okay? Just by having a sense of like, okay, you know, this isn't the only way forward, or I have other options. Like having options is so important for this sign. And you know, as I'm filming this, I think that this can relate to a lot of people because we're about to have Saturn in Pisces um, before too long. Um, and that's also about like uh, making contingency and foraging contingency. But um, for the Sun Pisces people, um, here's the thing, okay? Uh, there is deep trauma, okay? There is uh, pain and suffering, okay? Especially early on in life. And there's also distraction and um, the need to see things in a million different ways. And it's almost like the sun won't have it or the solar energy somehow finds a way to like deprive the Pisces person of being too immersed in these tragedies or too immersed in these uh, difficulties. The sun wants straightforwardness, ease, and it really burns away a lot of the dark shadowy stuff, right? I mean, the sun illuminates the dark and Pisces is the most dark sign. So what I see with a lot of sun in Pisces people is this feeling of like uh, cruel experiences or not really being able to balance this very well. And I mean, who could? It's, it's, hard, okay? All of the water signs are kind of hard for the sun because the sun does not harmonize very well with the water element. It's fire, right? So the water element has a bit of a threat to the sun and then the sun also evaporates the water. So all of the water signs kind of have this crux where it's like there's an emotional aspect of the character that is inborn. There's also a tendency toward pain or emotional difficulty shadow experiences that become a certain arc of empowerment or become a certain arc of strength. And that's what it has to become with the sun, especially in Pisces, but in any water sign, because it's going to dry all of that up and it's going to illuminate all of that. So we can't hide from the pain. We can't suppress or repress the pain. We can't um, also wallow in it okay for all the water signs but uh, pisces i hope all the water signs are listening to this honestly um you can't wallow in the pain and maybe this is actually what sun in pisces knows or deep down it knows and maybe that's why this is coming up in the pisces channeling and it didn't really uh, surface in the cancer or scorpio uh, segment um is because maybe with pisces wisdom it has started to be able to understand that wallowing or hyperfocus on the difficult hyperfocus on the um, torrential aspects of life have only threatened to extinguish the source of energy or have only uh, kind of put out the uh, fire of life force from within. And when a Pisces understands this, they are a force to be reckoned with. So when you mix Sun and Neptune energy, and it's like directed and wielded in a uncompromising way, it's kind of like Neptune's horses. It's kind of like um, 
very powerful stuff. The power of the ocean and the power of the sun. It's really, really powerful. And that's why like majority of Pisces sun people may have struggled with um, something that really compromises their strength. Okay, for example, substance abuse, for example, illness, for example, apathy, um, any type of psychological issue, difficulty as well, is most seen in Pisces because it rules over escapism. So the there tends to sometimes be this folly in about 80% of Pisces, and I can really help you today with this video here, there's this thought that by really encompassing the Neptunian energy of false reality, of escapism. This can be through substance, through virtual reality, through um, <clears throat> uh, future or past tripping, okay? There's a thought that by existing in those types of worlds, that energy is being gained, okay, again, sun in Pisces. But this is an illusion, and, Pi and Pisces' sun is in a way escaping the immense nature of their own power by making escapism a part of their daily routine, right? Virgo on the opposite. So <clears throat> uh, the difficulty for Pisces is having a daily routine or a constant day-to-day um, -day experience of um, illusion, escapism, fantasy, or dream space. That's why Sun in Pisces is such an incredible artist, musician, storyteller, uh, fantasy author, okay? It can end up benefiting them, and they can never be totally disconnected from it, okay? I'm not saying that you need to cut that off at all. Like, it's an important part of motivating and finding justification or finding the proper um, energy, okay, to do it. So you're not incorrect. Pisces are not incorrect when they think, okay, th these other worlds or these other paths or these unreal at the moment aspects of my life can create energy or can create momentum. They can, but it has to be kept in balance. And because Pisces has this power of like sun and Neptune combined, if you just come into the current moment, into the present moment, it's an unstoppable force, okay? But it's hard for one person to really to really wield without feeling discouraged because it's also kind of like a threat to other people. And I find that Pisces, more than any other sign, tends to really be like with the wings like snipped by other people or really attract like caregivers or authorities or, um, you know, other people who like really keep them down, but it's a choice also by the Pisces person because no one can keep them down if the Pisces doesn't want to be kept down. It's not a stoppable energy unless it wants to be in a golden cage or unless it wants to be kind of constrained in some way. So I really recommend for Pisces Sun people really look at what reality you're creating, you know. Uh, law of attraction stuff might be really good to study for Pisces because I think that this sun sign in particular is very connected to those types of doctrines, you know, careful because Pisces can also get over connected to uh, religion or philosophic doctrines in a way that they are just escaping. But um, that can be applied to anything, addiction of any kind, um, too strong of practices in any area does eventually become a form of escapism. So that's what this sign is transcending, okay, through this solar placement. And it also denotes a super old soul, okay? Probably the oldest souls are those people with the sun in Pisces or other really strong Pisces placements. And that has a lot of perks, that has a lot of benefits, that ha comes with a lot of inborn knowledge. But also I find that people with old souls don't have the, how can I say, they don't have the free space to make as many errors either. So Pisces people maybe can't get away with the same, you know, thrashing about or the same mistakes that an Aries can, okay? Pisces people have to really understand that their wisdom and their natural, like God-given uh, knowing is something that will never allow them to be justified 
in a trapped or powerless place. Okay. Really, as a Pisces, try to accept the power of knowledge that you do have. This also would resonate, I think, for Sagittarius, because these are both Jupiter-ruled signs in the traditional form um, before Neptune was discovered. Um, Sagittarius is also like this. There's a tendency for Sag and Pisces to um, get like trapped or kind of like uh, constricted or bridled, in a sense, um, and not really be able to freely express their expansive Jupiterian energy. So Pisces has more of a leg up than Sagittarius, though, and more of an ability to escape that, evade that, or not participate with that. Sagittarius actually has a harder time um, moving away from that and, and doesn't actually have the maturity that Pisces has to not engage with that or to just slip out of that. So congratulations if you're a Pisces son or someone with any amount of Pisces placements, you can pretty much slip out leave or escape anything. It's like escape artists or escape uh, masters. Uh, this escapism tendency can be your best um, your best tool, or it can also be um, an unfortunate cage as well. So um, Sun in Pisces people, uh, wisest, most uh, energetically elderly, uh, alien-like signs. And if you have the privilege to um, have a Pisces in your life, like as a friend, or um, really in any capacity, it is an important karmic relationship, okay? They're rare, they're rare. Uh, they are hard to find. All of the water signs are to a degree, but um, especially Pisces, it's like kind of a, um, a rarity. So treasure these people and um, also beware of conflicts with them, okay? I think I mentioned that for Leo as well, but I mean, each sign can be difficult in its own way, but I will say, Pisces is a very, very hard sign to have emotional conflicts with. Um, so we have to almost just choose to keep things peaceful with them. Okay. Anyway, everyone, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to conclude this video on that note. We've been going for a long time. I'm so happy to have created another installment in this series, my favorite series on this YouTube channel, Through the Signs, new spins on traditional placements. Um, I will link the playlist below where I've done the Ascendant, the Moon, Venus, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, and now the Sun, okay? Um, so this has been uh, going on for years now, and it's been a an intensive body of work. Um, and these are very difficult videos to put together. If you guys would please consider checking out the sponsor of today's video, Ara, uh, great, wonderful identity theft insurance, really a rising problem uh, globally right now in the internet age. I thought it was such an appropriate sponsorship for this video, you know, Sun, Ara. I just thought it was a really, really um, neat little collaboration there. And um, by using my link below, ara.com slash sky, you will get a nice little trial free for the service, and you will also be supporting this YouTube channel. It's a great way to kind of do two things at once. And um, uh, yeah, so also if you want to subscribe, uh, there's a red subscribe button below that's very helpful. And hit the thumbs up button. That's Those are two great free ways to support this channel as well. The subscribe, thumbs up, and the share button as well. I mean, you can share this. I think this is very shareable content. Everybody likes to hear about their sun sign. And uh, comment below as well and let me know what your sign is. What is your sun sign? Uh, what did you think about the interpretation? I have so enjoyed uh, spending this time with you all and I hope that you have uh, enjoyed the video. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to put together these videos for you all and I am just absolutely stunned with uh, the way that this series has uh, done and be sure to check out the other installments and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.